Welcome to Corks and Conversation with Ellie Marnie. Yes, um, we are here with the New York Times best-selling and award-winning author Ellie Marnie, all the way from Australia. Got to love that Zoom, Kathy. Her, <laughs> right. her latest novel, The Killing Code, is a suspenseful historical mystery that features strong women front and center in an expertly plotted mind game of a thriller set during World War II and wartime Washington, D.C. It involves women code breakers, a vicious serial killer and who is targeting government women, and even fits in a little romance. So I zipped right through this book, Kathy. You know, I thought I, it was great. Yeah, me too. And it's got all the, all the things, like you just said, just all the great things. Look at that. Look at that cover too. Nice cover. Yeah, you can see if you look close, you can see the like the numbers, the the code. Yeah, behind, it's really killing cool. codes in big red, but behind it is like the ripped up paper with like codes. Yeah. Written. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, Christy, I can't wait to talk about this novel with her as well, among other things. So, Ellie, welcome to the podcast. Great to have you. Hello, Kathy, and hello, Christy. It's really nice to be here from so far hello. away. <laughs> I know you sound like you're just around the corner, but <laughs> I know. We were, before we got before we got started, we were we got we got all excited and got started talking before we started recording, and we were comparing all of our current environments in South Australia, South Florida, and South Dakota. So more yes, more, right. to, more to come on that. Yes, we, and we, and I, I mean the the big takeaway is that we're actually time travel talking. Because yeah. it's tomorrow in Australia, tomorrow morning, yep. where it's f six in the evening here in Florida and five in South Dakota. So, yeah. And how's ten, tomorrow ten looking? <laughs> it's looking pretty good. The weather's great. <laughs> it's it's good. 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> on your tomorrow. So I'm coming to you from the future. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Did you have any kangaroo interactions in our future? We talked uh, about kangaroos yeah. a little before. You will always get kangaroo interactions if you're up my way because I'm, like I was saying before, I'm a couple of hours out of um, the main city and out in the country areas and there's kangaroos everywhere <laughs> at the moment because we've had a lot of rain um, and so they they proliferate during, during the really good times um, when there's lots of grass. So they're literally everywhere and I was just saying that... Um, <laughs> I was driving my kids to school and I'm teaching my son to drive. So he's driving. So I'm constantly saying to him, okay, you need to slow down because there's going to be kangaroos everywhere and <laughs> you have to be careful. And you're always, you're never watching the road. You're always looking on either side of the road to see if they're going to jump from either oh side. God. I know. That's and funny. tell us, tell us the, the rule. Yeah. You, you drive towards the. You, you okay. have to drive yeah. at them. Yeah, because they're the, otherwise, if you try to drive around them, they will 100% be guaranteed to just jump in front of you. So the only way to avoid them is to just drive straight at them, and then they will jump away. <laughs> so if you hit one, I mean, that could be a lot of damage, kind of like hitting oh, yeah. a deer or something. In How the big are they? Oh, you'll, you'll ride off your car. Yeah, 100%. So they would be about as big and heavy as a deer. I think a full-grown kangaroo would most definitely... That would be the mm. end of your car, pretty much. Mm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Now, do they do they have kangaroo hunting season? Ah, uh, I mean, they God do. Forbid to they say do. that, Depends but on... I mean, like, no, I know we have deer do. hunting to make yeah. sure that you know we're not. Yeah, they do have um, kangaroo culling here because yeah, they just become like plague proportions, um, right. particularly in the farming areas. I know a lot of people who oh. who will. Um, yeah, shoot some kangaroo. And yeah. also, you know, it's it's pretty good quality meat too as well. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who who will hunt for, for kangaroo meat. But um not so much around here, but in the in the bigger more open spaces of Australia you'll you'll get people who hunt for kangaroo. Wow. For sure. If you want wow. some kangaroo steak or kangaroo sausages. <laughs> I um, have never had that. That's I haven't true. either. I've never even seen that as an option. I think I have ever. seen it an, uh, as an option. Have you? Yeah, now that you mentioned, I have seen it as an option. I mean, that's the same. I mean, we, I live in a rural area and there are tons of deer and on the mm -hmm. western side of our state, um, my 
husband's family has a ranch and they have a huge problem with, um, well, not a problem. They're beautiful and they're wonderful, but, um, they have elk, just tons and tons oh. of elk. And so there, there is an elk hunting season to try to reduce the numbers. Cause you know, mm-hmm. herds of elk will come through a ranch and you know, there's like 50 in a herd and they'll just take down the fence line they'll and, just you know, wipe it out. just yeah. wipe it out. And so, um, we, well, we often are offered lots of elk and deer meat from the ranch as well. Uh, I wonder if we I mean, could do that for like tourist season down here. <laughs> oh, Christy. It took me a minute. I was like, I what am totally say? kidding. <laughs> we would never do that. Oh my goodness. Okay, I think it's now time to segue into the novel. <laughs> let's, let's ask some questions, okay? Uh, let's We've do started. That. Now that we've started talking about homicide, yes. Yeah, yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what it was the lead in for the story, okay? <laughs> okay, so yeah, because now it's time to talk about serial killers. So that's ex- excellent timing. Yeah. Um, so I am holding up the novel again. If you're, um, It is The Killing Code. This is, how, how, many, how many novels have you written preceding this? Um, okay, so this is my 10th novel. Um, and mm-hmm. it's very strange because I'm considered a sophomore author with this book in the US, but um, yeah, uh, so it's only the second book that I've had published in the States. But yeah, I've been, I've been in the publishing business for quite a while now, nearly, this, so this is my 10th year. Wow. So this is my 10th book, my 10th year. And oh, well, yeah. so there you go. You're pretty prolific too. There you go. Yeah. It's a pretty wild, it's a pretty wild ride. <laughs> mm-hmm. So let's just give everybody a little background on this particular novel. And I would love to talk about your other novels too, because this is a historical. Mm-hmm. It is, and it has such an interesting and unique point of view. I just, I think that's why Chrissy and I both loved it so much. There are some uh, young women working for the government during World War II in mm-hmm. Washington, D.C. And that's a whole different world away from modern day, next day, Australia, where you're at. No kangaroos there. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm so curious what made you write about code breakers during World War II in Washington, D.C.? Well, this is a very long story, so I'm going to try and give you the Reader's Digest version. Um, (laughs) I have always... I've uh, written a lot of historical crime. So the book that I released before, The Killing Code, Nunch Shall Sleep, is set in 1982. And I'm I'm kind of fascinated with how that changes crime investigation. I mean, I know that mm. you read, you both read a lot of crime. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there's certain things that we kind of take for granted uh, in current criminal investigation, um, like being able to just send an email to um, a district attorney or a coroner or, or contact people by phone, you know, anywhere at any time. And also some really basic things like fingerprinting and DNA, you know, identification and all those sorts of things. So what happens to a criminal investigation when you strip away some of that stuff? Um, so 1943, the book is set and, you know, there's no DNA um identification of murderers there's no way to fax a copy of some you know right or whatever to another party to get corroboration so I find all of that really I find the mechanics of crime investigation when you take a lot of that convenient stuff away I find it really Mm -hmm. interesting but I also became completely obsessed with code breakers after watching um, a British show, and I don't know if they have it in the States. It was called The Bletchley Circle, and it was released, oh, I don't know, maybe 2017, 2016. So it's about young women who work at the code breaking facility in the UK during World War II, which was called Bletchley Park. Okay. And it was in it was an incredible hive mind <laughs> where they they started very early trying to break German codes like the Enigma code and that's where we get all the stories about Alan Turing from you know the imitation game and mm-hmm. look I mean it was an amazing place it was an amazing facility and there were thousands of women working there um, because 70 percent of the workforce was female because quite a lot of you know I mean the men, yeah, the men were at war fighting yeah so there were a lot of very clever women working in um, Bletchley Park and the Bletchley Circle series 
was about how 10 years after the war, a number of them get together again to help solve a, a crime, a, a murder that's occurred in their district. And it just completely fascinated me, the idea of these women co- collaborating on and using their old skills, you know, that they, mm-hmm. that they weren't allowed to talk about because, um, because, you know, you had to sign the Official Secrets Act. You weren't allowed to talk about the work that you did during the war. So I thought, well, I mean, because I write for teenagers, my first thought is always, well, like this, but what if it was teenagers? <laughs> <laughs> What if it was teenage girls doing this? And then I dug into it a little more and I discovered that actually um, the average age of the women who worked in code breaking uh, during World War II was 19. Oh, wow. So I thought, yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. So they were already teenagers, quite a lot of them. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were straight out of school or they were in the first year or two of teacher's college or, you know, just well, before they, they had they, families and things like that. So Yeah. They were, and and so I thought um I would dive into it a little bit more. Um we had code breaking facilities here like that in Australia during World War Two. And I knew obviously about Bletchley Park, but um there's a number of books written about Bletchley Park. So I was looking into what it was like for US code breakers and I picked up this amazing book it's up here on my shelf actually by a woman called Liza Mundy Uh, she wrote a book called Code Girls that was released in 2017 where she just you know it's this big thick book she's just dived right into what their lives were like and how they worked and the kind of work yeah it was incredible I mean were you I think you were just thrilled to find that resource when this idea came oh my god yeah and then there was a line in the book and said oh and then in You know, the summer of 1941, the army decided to buy this facility to to house all the code breakers. And it was called Arlington Hall. And it was a former ladies college. And I thought, that's it. That's my entry to the story. Yeah, it worked perfect. (laughs) Yeah. So it was just luck. (laughs) You know, when you mentioned the limitations on historical law enforcement, the first thing I thought about was... There's a U.S. writer by the name of Sue Grafton. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. Oh, she used to write wonderful mysteries, the alphabet mysteries, that were all set in like 1982 to 1986. And she didn't ever move past that because in interviews she had said how much she enjoyed that limitation that you you know had to drive to the police station to talk to somebody and you had to drive to talk to that private investigator. Um, and that I think that is a really cool perspective. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's really fun when you put those constraints on the people who are investigating. And then obviously there's four girls in the killing code and they're all investigating these um, murders and they're trying to, you know, break the code pattern of a serial killer who's murdering government girls in Washington, D.C. So not only are they applying their skills, but they're also very constricted by what they can do, like they used to work seven days on and have one day off. And then, you know, they used to work in shifts. So they would, they were not always guaranteed to be on the same shift. And um, there was 24 hour rotation. So, you know, there were things that they couldn't say in public, they couldn't talk about with other people. So I was sort of thinking it would be really interesting to put all of these constraints, additional constraints on the people who were investigating, as well as the fact that they were women in the 40s, right. and the early 40s, which was significant disadvantage right there. <laughs> yeah. And so have you been to like D.C. or that area or? No. <laughs> you're going to, I was going to say, you're all be, you'll be like, oh, my God. How did she write that? <laughs> That's called research, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think some of the benefit might be because it is set in the past. So there's not a whole lot of people that are going to be around going, well, hey, that wasn't exactly like that because it was far enough back that, you know, you Mm -hmm. get a little bit of artistic license. (laughs) You get a lot of artistic license with Arlington Hall. In addition to the fact that all the landmarks have changed from D.C. Mm -hmm. in 43, Um, Arlington Hall is still owned by the NSA, so no one can go in there. (laughs) Oh, wow. So, in fact, it was really quite hard to find information about it, even online. Um, Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's a lot of restrictions still on what you can look at now 
there were some very old photos of, you know, and some internal plans of what the grounds and the mansion of Arlington Hall used to be lo- like back in the 40s when before it became uh, a, an army base, basically. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, I, I kind of have been a bit sneaky <laughs> setting it in a place where no one's going to fact check yeah. me unless they work for the NSA and they go and visit Arlington And then Hall. they probably can't say anything anyway. Yeah, so. they can't say anything right. anyway. Right? <laughs> That's a pretty safe amount of historical <laughs> research, actually. I know. Because yeah. huh? we've talked to a lot of historical writers who comment about how often, you know, if they get something wrong, audience members will pick up on it and they will oh, yeah. let them know. And so <laughs> kudos for finding something that people can't really respond on. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I've had people say that to me. Oh, I know that street corner. I I grew up around there or they've, you know, commented in reviews. So yeah, it definitely happens. People will grab you. <laughs> <laughs> let you know. <laughs> yeah, they'll let you know. Okay, so listen, we're about midway. Let's take um, our question on the bottle, Christy. This is a question, a random question. Christy always has a plethora of them behind her. And it's a question you might get to at the bottom of a bottle, which we have done many times together. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see what the question is today. All right. The question is, if you had to start one new hobby, what would it be? It's a pretty sedate one. If I had to start a new hobby, what would it be? Oh, I have just decided to start a new hobby, actually. Really? Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, because now that my children are grown up, I have I have four boys. Um, oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Fun. So that's been a very busy life. Yeah. But my oldest boy has entered high school now and he's kind of okay to fend for himself. And my two oldest boys are 20 and 22. So they're living down in the city, working and studying now. So I think it might be time for me to actually do something for myself, which would be really nice. Yeah. Um, What a concept. (laughs) I know, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So um, I was thinking I might start sewing. (laughs) I'm going to really? start sewing clothes. Yes, I know. Are you oh. going to sew clothes for yourself or for other people? Yeah. yeah. I don't think I, I don't think any of my sons would appreciate if I sewed clothes. <laughs> yeah. for them. Um, but I will definitely try and um going to try oh. out some simple patterns and try out some clothes. And... What's your first one on the list? What kind of piece of clothing? What kind of thing? Uh just like a plain shirt. But okay. I want to buy some nice fabric and stuff like that yeah. because um, because nice clothes are really expensive. So they are. Yeah. I yeah. that intimidates me. I can't even sew a button on. Well, I'm embarrassed to say. I mean, I can sew. I can get the button on, but I, what I'm really bad at is that final knot. Isn't uh, that terrible? Yeah. I totally understand. I grew up. My mother used to do some sewing when I was a kid. And, you know, I always roundly rejected all of the clothes that she <laughs> slaved mm-hmm. over. Um, sure, of course. She was making them for me. And then I was scared to use the sewing machine for a really long time because she had an accident one day where she actually <gasps> sewed through Come the nail here. of her finger into her finger. Ow! And, yeah, I know. So I was like, oh, okay, that's put me off using a sewing machine As pretty much would. forever. <laughs> Um, but now I think, you know, I'm old enough, I'm grown up enough now, and I've recovered over from my trauma, and I think I might I might give it a shot. Face your fears. Yeah. I'm very impressed by that because I'm intimidated by that. That sounds really hard to me. I'm, I'm going to start small. I'll probably start with, like, handkerchiefs and then work my way up. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Christy? Any new hobbies? I do not have any planned, but if I had to say today, I think I would, um, and I've thought about this before and dabbled, but I would like to learn how to play guitar. Ah, that would be awesome. Yeah. You can take it everywhere. You know, I I can't really sing, but I could play. Oh, that's really cool too. Yeah. That is pretty cool, actually. I do. I love that. All I right. I'm going to do it. Do it. I know. 
Let's check back in with the two of you next year. Christy can okay, play a song. Okay, okay. <laughs> like year from now, sure I'll, be, my shit. I'll be strumming some some chords while you're sh- wearing your shirt. <laughs> and what it, what is Kathy doing for her hobby? Yeah, what are you going to do? Oh, um, I will tell you, the first thing that popped in my mind was I was recently on vacation um, on a beach. And there was a guy who was um, would take you out sailing on a small sailboat. And I've always wanted to learn to sail. Always, oh, like a yeah. little individual, like one or two person, like, mm-hmm. you know, hobby craft kind of sailboat. And um, my neighbor growing up used to, a good friend of my dad's, always would go out to the lakes and sail on his own. Just And I just mm-hmm. thought that seemed so lovely. Mm-hmm. And I would love to learn to sail. So that's, that's. That All right. Next year. Yeah. I've got a, <laughs> I've got a friend, Amy Kaufman. She's an author of science fiction and fantasy and she grew up sailing and yeah so she's totally into it and yeah it sounds kind of complicated to me but um i think it could become one of those things that you get really into that you get really addicted by yeah Yeah. i would i would love that i my husband um was a pilot growing up that's what his family did as a hobby they owned a plane and they would fly all over the place wow. and, and he's wanting to get back into flying. And so we were talking about the irony of that when we were on vacation, I was like, well, I'm going to go sail. And he's like, well, I'm going to go fly. I was like, cool. <laughs> we'll see you in a few hours. <laughs> yeah. So you need to, you need to move to on a lake with a little runway with nearby. Right? Strip, yeah. 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 Isn't it fun to think about the things that we can pick up and can learn and, and it, that it makes me want to do it even more now. So, yeah. So let's go on with some questions because I wanted to ask you about the hashtag Love Oz YA book club that you (laughs) co-run. And and I know that you mostly write YA thrillers. So I'm just kind Mm of um, wondering how you got involved in all that and and why. Um, Well, in about 2015, a whole bunch of YA authors and some... Uh, booksellers and things like that, we all got together and realized that we really needed to start, you know, encouraging local teenagers to read books that were local to them because we were getting a lot of input from teenagers saying that they were reading stuff from overseas, but there's some really amazing YA authors in Australia who seem to punch pretty well above their weight, you know, on the world stage. Um, so we sort of thought, well, it'd be really good if we could start advocating for that a little bit more and encouraging Australian young people to read their local literature. So we set up, um, hashtag love Oz way a, as a way of advocating and promoting. And I set up the book club just on a whim, really. I was like, okay, well, I could encourage people to just read one way a book a month. Um, it wouldn't be a huge investment of their time and, you know, it might be a bit of fun. So now it's it's like nearly eight years or something later and we've oh, wow. got like nearly a thousand people in the book club on Facebook. I mean, not everyone's wow. participating every month yeah i know now do um, you make uh do you make your kid your sons be part of it <laughs> <laughs> no they would they would not um, yeah. they would kill me no that i let them choose their own <laughs> they, <would kill> me. <laughs> they have their i let them choose their own path as far mm. as books and reading go they are actually all really into reading mm-hmm. um and they they've even started reading some of my early manuscripts before. Sometimes I'll say, "Oh, okay, is this working?" And then I'll give them the manuscript. Wow. And, yeah, and then they can give me some feedback on it, which is really cool. Yeah, um, really cool. for sure. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. I think for the Love Oswaye book club, it was just a way of highlighting the local books as well that ha- are coming out. And also, there's an old, there's a lot of old historical novels here by people like uh, Ruth Park and Brian Caswell um, and, you know, the, um, Victor Kelleher. I mean, you guys may not have heard of these authors, but they're kind of part of the history of Australian literature and YA mm-hmm. literature here. So we're kind of trying to raise a bit of awareness about that and have a bit of fun with it. Yeah. Kathy and I are both writers too, and the novel that I'm actually editing right now is YA yeah. And it's also a crime fiction or whatever. But, you know, that was part of the reason why I wanted to talk to you. And also, 
when, I, when we were reading this, I mean, both Kathy and I are like, well, I don't know. This could not, you know, how do we know that this is YA? Because mm -hmm. it honestly, I feel like, you know, yeah. and I often feel that way about a lot of YA mm -hmm. books, but this is definitely one that I feel like could be just marketed as an adult historical As a mystery. regular book. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I think that too. I think, um, I think you have to be a little inventive with the teenage characters because like, like I was saying before, I think they're a bit more constrained. You know, the first time mm -hmm. I wrote a YA crime novel, it was my first book, Every Breath. And I, I had to think really hard about how to, how to bring teenagers into an active role in an adult world, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, I think it's easier writing historical because teenagers were already kind of acting like adults in 1943 mm -hmm. you know a lot of them right. were working outside the home they had jobs they married very young mm -hmm. um, a lot of them were off at war so it didn't feel like there was as much of a partition between teenagers and adults in the same mm -hmm. way that there seems to be today yeah it in this book you know I was thinking oh four teenage girls like you say 19 year old girls but these these women are they're full adult women. yeah and teenage girls at the same time. And if I was to describe four 19 year old girls now today, I, yeah. I wouldn't have assigned the level of maturity that was needed and expected of these young women. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do like the historical aspect of that because it does allow you to look at, I don't know, kind of force us to, yeah, just identify different issues and how we're handling it. You know, trying to protect kids, I guess, from being exposed to ideas, God forbid, we don't want anybody to read about right. anything that makes well, the thing I love about book banning. The only thing I'm going to say about it is I love that people think books are so freaking powerful that they better <laughs> ban them. I'm like, great. Yeah. And I had read once, um, Judy Bloom was like, please ban my book. All it does is make it sell more. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I just, I do love that there is that much power in reading. And if people are scared of it and they're so scared that they want to take it away, I'm like, well, that makes me, it's still that I powerful. Agree. So mm -hmm. there we yeah. go. That's the yep. only good thing I can have to say about it. <laughs> they've, they've always, there's always been that power there. And that's why, you know, people consistently trying to ban information mm -hmm. um, in times of unrest or, you mm -hmm. know, during war. I mean, one of the things that I was investigating a lot, well, there were two, two sort of main areas that I had trouble finding information about when I was researching the, the book. And one of them was the black code breaking community. I found it really difficult to find information about um, black female code breakers. And part of that was, well, a lot of people just didn't think it was important enough to write down, you know? I mean, I, I'm sure that there's more documents out there. There's got to be more letters from, from, you know, the women who participated or people who were working with the unit. I mean, all we know is that uh, William Coffey was a janitor at Arlington Hall and liaised between black staff and the code-breaking unit. And when they realized that they were just becoming so inundated with code-breaking work that they needed more people to do the work. And also when Eleanor Roosevelt, who in 1944 made a rule about uh, desegregating military jobs, you know, she mm. was she was integral towards you know, for FDR to make that decision and to, to make that legislation, then suddenly they had to hire a certain number of black staff. And so this this man, William Coffey, became the de facto leader of the black staff who were now doing the code breaking on the commercial codes. You know, they were they were looking at trade communications because, you know, the war was on, but trade was mm -hmm. still happening. Mm -hmm. um, so they that became their area. Um and we know a few of the names of the women who worked there, people like Geneva Arthur. But there was so much happening at that time in civil rights. You know, the March on Washington was threatened in 1941. And there was just, there was there was a lot of sit-down protests around lunch counters and segregation on buses and things like that. So there was heaps happening. And it was, I, I would have to say there's got to be more information out there about Black code breakers. I'd love to find out more about it. I dug and dug and I probably only uncovered maybe three or four articles max about it. So that suppression of information or just the neglect. And so you know, the lack of, you know, yeah. acknowledgement. 
mm-hmm. lack of acknowledgement. Somebody knows it, but you you worry about people aging out of of the ability to do those interviews. Yeah. You know, at this at this point, one hundred percent. Yeah, that's right. Oh They're just gosh. getting a bit too old. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have passed away, so yeah, it's it's already quite hard to get some of that information down. Um, and a lot of them still won't speak about it. You know, that was the right. other thing when they signed the act, the Secrets Act. They they took that very seriously. You know, they didn't expect to be rewarded. There was no expectation mm-hmm. of recognition from the work that they did. And so they were happy to keep that secret, the people who worked in code breaking. Um, and a lot of these women just, even when those regulations were relaxed, they just had gotten so used to not talking about it that they just... It was something that they didn't yeah. discuss. Um, and queer women as well working mm-hmm. in the military and working in oh. code-breaking facilities. I get asked all the time, oh, why did you write a sapphic romance into this book? And it was like, well, I don't know. You've got thousands of women all living yeah. and working on I'm the same premises. <laughs> of course it's going to happen. <laughs> Definitely going to happen, you know. Yeah. Even if it wasn't, um, it wasn't really discussed, but it was, mm-hmm. it was, uh, kind of a unacknowledged secret that, mm-hmm. um, you know, they used to use all these all these euphemisms for women who are in who are in same sex relationships, and they would say, "Oh, you know, she's uh, she is her longtime companion." Yeah. That was the that was the code. <laughs> That's what makes the story so fascinating there's just so many layers these aren't yeah. just you know that it's just it's such a and it's such a different perspective that we don't see often enough about right. wartime stuff so yeah okay christy has a final question which of your characters would you like to share a meal with and what would it be that's a really and you can't good say kangaroo no i'm just kidding you can't <laughs> if you're <honest>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, that would be, that would be a surprising meal choice. (laughs) Um, (laughs) you know, you can eat, you can eat crocodile meat and kangaroo meat here in Australia. It's kind of, yeah, nobody really. We we see, we have alligator here in South Florida. That's what freaks everybody out from here. You know, well, yeah. Do you eat alligator in, I mean, Mm -hmm. can you eat it? Really? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's good. Yeah. That's wild. Um, yeah. okay. Well, it's Who not that different it? than a crocodile for sure. <laughs> this is true. This is true, actually. Um, okay. Okay. Well, I'm not going to choose kangaroo or crocodile for the meal. <laughs> um, who would I, who would I converse with? I would probably, and this is going to freak people out, but in my debut US book, Nuncha Sleep, uh, there's a teenage sociopath who is one of the, <laughs> One of the lead characters, his name is Simon Goodmanson, and he's he's kind of like a YA Hannibal Lecter, I guess. Oh, um, hey he's, everybody! He's very. I'm going to have uh, to read this book for sure. <laughs> please, please. Um, I think I think if you like the Killing Code, you'd probably have a good time with that one. Mm-hmm. Um, so he is incarcerated. Um, and I'd like him to stay incarcerated. And I think we could take a little card table or something into the jail and <laughs> um, have a conversation. Just because I've, he's a really fascinating character to write. He's super smart. He's he's very attractive and charming and highly manipulative. And I would kind of like to just see him in action, I guess. Oh my I would like to pick well, his you're brain. Not, he's not so much like Hannibal Lecter. Like you aren't going to be eating human parts or anything, are no. you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we wouldn't do that. We would have okay. a very, some, some really nice wine and, mm-hmm. you know, so, some really nice um, French cuisine, I think. Okay. For oh. Simon. Very nice. <laughs> I think he would enjoy that very much after the deprivations of being in jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the whole jail thing. <laughs> okay. All right. So, Ellie, when our um, U.S. listeners want to find out more about you and your previous novels, where should they go? Um, okay. So, they can go to my website, um, which is, you know, www.elliemoney.com. Um, and, you know, I, all my books are on Goodreads. Um, I'm also on Twitter, which hmm. is kind of, uh, dropping off a little bit now, but um, I guess I had a lot of fun on Twitter, but now I'm kind of transferring my attentions to Instagram and TikTok. So I'm at Ellie Money Author on TikTok. Um, 
so yeah i look i'm on everything that's what you've got to do these days to uh, yeah, do an author you're you've got to be on all the platforms you've got to be on all the things gonna be out there <laughs> yeah oh I, and I, I enjoy a little tiktok so i will check you out on on tiktok because yeah. i, I <laughs> thank enjoy you TikTok. i'm actually quite having having quite a lot of fun with tiktok are you to, are you yeah I used to be. I, I, I was thinking of, of trying it, but yeah. um, maybe maybe in our off season, I'll have more time. Yeah, no? that's what we're thinking. We're thinking we got to get there. It is actually really good fun. Um, the, yeah. it, it's something about it. It's the spontaneity of it and the um, silliness of it. You know, whereas Instagram is very beautiful, um, mm-hmm. whereas TikTok is a bit more warts and all. And I kind of like that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, we'll have to check it out. So it's just been a great, great conversation, lots of fun. And we're so, we're so glad you could join us from down under. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. Hello from tomorrow. (laughs) I can't wait. It looks beautiful. And so let's, let's give a cheers to the killing code and um, (laughs) cheers to you. you. Cheers to you. Thanks for joining us for today's episode. Subscribe to our podcast on our website, gameofbookspodcast.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you liked what you heard, you can give us a five-star rating or review. You can also subscribe on YouTube where you can watch and listen. On gameofbookspodcast.com, you can find all the information about what we talked about on this episode. And you can sign up for our newsletter and enter our fun contests and giveaways. We also post our stories and links on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Hope to see you there. I can guarantee you that we had fun today. And we hope you did too. Cheers.